Hello, everybody. Again, thank you for joining us. My name is David Kojic. I'm the founder and CEO of Uconnect. And I'm very excited uh, for today's conversation and especially to have two such incredible panelists here. So without further ado, let's uh, let's jump into it. Harold, Lionel, welcome. Uh, very excited to have you. We'd love for you to start with a little bit of an intro. Um, um, your uh, institution, your background, um, a little bit about your career office. Lionel, would you like to start? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Leonel Thompson. I am Director of Career and Professional Development at Langston University. Uh, Langston University is Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma's only historically Black college and university. Um, so located in Langston, Oklahoma, it's the western part of the state. Uh, campus size residential is about 1,700 students we have two urban campuses with each about 150 students on it. Uh, and I am a team of one in my career office. So I am the director, administrative assistant, program coordinator, career counselor, uh, all of that. So um, happy to be here today. Bless you. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for that, Leonel, and we're, we're really happy to have you. Harold, tell us about you. Sure, Harold Bell. I'm a former student of Langston University. I spent two years there, freshman, sophomore year at Langston before I transferred. Uh, I am currently the director at Spelman College of Career Services. I have been here, this is my 21st year. Our campus uh, is about uh, just under 2,300 students. We've been having major spikes uh, in enrollment. I have an office of seven, including myself, and we report through enrollment management here on campus. Awesome. Thank you so much, Harold. Um, and, uh, and very excited to get into the conversation just uh, as a little bit of background. As I mentioned, my name is David Kojic. I am the founder and CEO of Uconnect. Um, for those of you who are new to Uconnect, um, we've created the first all-in-one virtual career center, which is really designed to help colleges and universities uh, organize and curate all of their career resources, data, and information with the goal of improving visibility, accessibility, and engagement with all of the awesome uh, work that you all do in career services. So um, in short, just trying to make sure that more students are using your resources earlier in their journey um, and uh, making the most of, of all the uh, resources, connections, opportunities that you all offer. Um, and the topic today is really about launching a digital sponsorship program, top of mind for a lot of folks, um, for several reasons. One is, um, you know, there's a real opportunity to uh, lean in and help employer partners increase visibility, increase their brand recognition, and uh, more effectively attract early talent. It's very hard to get students' attention these days, as everybody on this call, I'm sure, is 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 well aware, and that is no different for. Um, employers and, and recruiters. And so um, leaning in to help those employer partners um, connect with, with students is, um, uh, is, a really, is a really great opportunity. And then also to expand budget, right? To help uh, career offices um, do all the great things that they can uh, do to support students, alums, add new resources, expand their staff, um, add more programming. So um, if budget is a challenge, launching a digital sponsorship program um, is a great idea to um, to help augment the budget that you have. So um, that's a little bit about what we're talking about today. And um, I'd love to just jump into questions with Leonel and Harold. So I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Um, so just start with, with you, Leonel, if you don't mind. Tell us a little bit about you know, what you're uh, doing at Langston as it relates to the sponsorship program. Somebody asks you, hey, tell me about the program. How would you respond? Yeah, I would say um, sponsorship program is, is not new at Langston, but this iteration is. So previously the sponsorship program, a uh, little bit of background, let me back up. My role was vacant for two years before I got here. <laughs> um, and so the sponsorship program was through um, institutional advancement. That's where the office was housed. I now report through academic affairs, but it was, outrageous, like $10,000 to get your name on the career fair, right? And I talked about the size of our university, which didn't make sense. Um, and so with when I came in, I wanted to, one, try to manage being a team of one, 
work on programming, and then build the brand of employers. Uh, Langston was not known, two years without a career office. How do we build up recognition, the brand, um, get students involved, get employers back on campus? So basically put together, did a lot of research, because I'd never done that before, a sponsorship package of schools that were like mine, similar HBCUs, Oklahoma schools, size, to see what, what makes sense as far as dollar amount. Do I do gold, platinum, silver? Do I do a menu of options? And what I settled on was a menu of options. To be a distinguished employer partner is like the granddaddy of all, all things or sponsoring individual things such as student employee of the month or a career track. And that really helped because I knew to help scale my office, I needed to have you connect. I needed a virtual <laughs> career center because I couldn't meet with all 2000 students. So having their name associated with it helps pay for the platform as well. Awesome, thank you, Lionel. And Harold, uh, somebody bumps into you on campus and asks you about your digital sponsorship program. How do you, uh, how do you respond? Sure, sure. So as Lionel said, uh, sponsorships are definitely no stranger to us. Uh, I actually staff with our institutional uh, advancement, at least my counterpart there who's over corporate relations, we meet on a weekly basis. And so it's almost like another, another job. Uh, but uh, the reason we do that, because we know that those sorts of partnerships, those strategic partnerships, all strategic partnerships lead to talent acquisition. And so, um, and so we know that we must work closely together hand in hand in terms of facilitating those partnerships. So uh, prior to this, uh, just speaking of the Career Center in, gen in general, we had two signature programs uh, that we have that were professional development programs and I would pretty much get those sponsored. We were able to get those sponsored for years, like each one of those, uh, each was sponsored continuously over 15 years. Um, and during the pandemic, we decided to uh, just settle down a minute on that because of what everyone knows about students not really feeling um, these all these virtual events. Um, but what I would always get asked, what's the opportunity to sponsor? And so uh, we don't have sponsors necessarily um, sponsoring buildings, brick and mortar and that sort of thing. That was something that occurred before I came, but we don't do as much of that. But one of the challenges we have is an overabundance of employers and technically graduate schools as well uh, that come to Spelman. And it is a what I describe as a high volume, um, intense, highly competitive recruiting environment. And so employers are constantly trying to figure out, well, how do I position myself in all of that? Because the world is at your beck and call and I'm trying to figure out how do I stand above the crowd? And so when we were looking at the Virtual Career Center, uh, my thought was, well, here's an opportunity uh, outside of brick and mortar to digitally uh, represent yourselves in a space uh, that's not with all the crowd. And so we intentionally did not have a lot of sponsors because the whole point was, there's already a lot of folks coming to Spelman. Let me see if I can kind of make this safe kind of reserve space for these sponsors and give them an opportunity to uh, reside in a space that was going to have high traffic by design. Uh, in terms of the vision that we have for the center. So um, that's a little bit about kind of how we got there. So, yeah, totally. And you mentioned moving away from brick and mortar. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges with the brick and mortar approach or the sort of physical in-person approach to, to sponsorships? Um, and then sort of coupled with that, the benefits of doing it in a digital or virtual environment? Sure. Um, so, like I said, we only had two signature programs uh, prior to the Virtual Career Center, uh, and that had a limited amount of students in it. 
Uh, and so the bandwidth in terms of exposure and how many students you would be exposed to was limited to how many students were enrolled in either one of those respective programs. Uh, so that was a very finite view, uh, finite access, if you will, of, of students, if you just you know, sponsored one of those programs. And so with the Virtual Career Center, again, we were saying, well, this is something that we were going to begin directing all, not only all students to, but because it's really a community uh, for those of you who are familiar with the site. So we're not only just talking about students now because there's faculty communities, alum, alumni, alumni uh, communities, uh, you know, prospective students, current students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the ecosystem that we talk about in career services that we know is critical uh, to make career services success, really make outcomes successful in general. Now you've built that ecosystem through technology di digitally on the site. And so now you're not just even engaging students, you've now increased your exposure level tenfold by availing yourself now to a whole potential ecosystem. Yeah. I, I love that too. Um, just to tag on, Please. that was one thing that never existed. So to get a prospective student, for example, Saturday, we did a university, uh, parent university, parents of prospective students, and they show the site, <laughs> you know, so, so the parents would know, hey, your student's going to come in and they have all these resources and and today we're doing like senior day, high school day, and the site's being profiled. So it, it just, it's a further reach than a brick and mortar, a name on a, on a conference room. Yeah, and, and while, we're, um, while we're at it, I'm actually gonna pull up the site so you can talk a little bit about, um, uh, about the site and show off some of the employer sponsors that you have. But while we're doing that, Lee, now tell me a little bit about um, your goals. You came to Langston, uh, recently, um, and sort of launching a sponsorship program was a was a major and early priority for you. Tell me a little bit about your goals um, in launching the program and um, and leaning into that as early as early as you did. Yeah, my goals centered around student success um, because there was a void. Getting students caught up um, centered around scaling my office, and then making Langston well-known and partnering with organizations and companies um, to start this pipeline. We didn't have that before. And so I couldn't do it by myself, boots on the ground. So when I started at Langston, it was November of 2020. No one was here, right? <laughs> and so how was I gonna reach people? It wasn't gonna be going to meet with them like I did in the prior role at their offices. We're also in rural Oklahoma, so the next biggest city is 45 minutes away. How can I reach them in a way, everyone, as Harold talked about the community, how can I reach them in a, in a, in a, just a better way? And that was digital. So, but I, you know, also the buy-in, you have to have, you know, someone's got to put up the investment because otherwise we'd be in the same cycle. So finding, targeting those employers who were, um, that covered all of our schools, most of our majors, so there was something for everyone. So my goals were definitely student success, which is key and tying that to institutional goals, scaling the office, because we know that students need a resume review at midnight. I'm not here to do that. Um, and, uh, and then also getting, getting the recognition out about Langston and the employers, making that connection. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And um, tell us a little bit about, uh, I'm going to go to your sponsorships page here. You have uh, 10 sponsors. Tell us a little bit about the sponsorship program and, um, and let's dive into one of the particular sponsors in, in general. Yeah. So the sponsorship program, again, they got um, a menu of options. So one of the things when COVID started to kind of lift in the summer of 21, I hosted an on-site and virtual employer summit that was introduced in Langston to, to the world, so to speak. And it was there that I made the, the ask for the sponsorships. We're doing this digital program because I'm a team of one. This is a great way to build your brand with employers. 
And so uh, had had many employers, kind of like Carol said, we were just swimming in employers, you know, um, to get for people to come. But this was their time to to put their money where their mouth was. And so um, we, I, I did the ask, you know, distinguished employer partner gets uh, a career track time on campus. Um, they plan their own programming, but that was the employer summit was the big way to ask. And so. Um, and also we were able, I was able to work with them on unique aspects. So not only did they sponsor the platform, but also unique ways. So Paycom, for example, is headquartered in Oklahoma City, uh, 45 minutes from us. And they also sponsored their, uh, our, our clothes closet. So one of the things, in addition to just sponsoring this, their, their name is on our closet. So students come and get professional attire free of charge sponsored by Paycom. And so that's just an example of how it grew um, from we had they have a page. They were actually here. They had their their day on campus yesterday. Um, and that's part of being this distinguished employer partner is, you know, everyone knew Paycom was here. You know, it was all over social media. And, and for me to be able to do that for 10 as opposed to, to 50 who ask is a lot better for my resources and time. Yeah, absolutely. I love the employer summit and, and I want to talk more about that. Um, just quickly, Harold, um, I'm showing your virtual career center. Can you talk a little bit about how you use the virtual career center and then, and then we can dive into to highlight one of your sponsors. Yeah. And I just want to, David, just really quickly, because as we're sort of talking about this, I, I saw a question real quick that said, what did you mean by digital sponsorships? I think we better clarify that. So <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> So by digital sponsorship, we're meaning that we're referring to the Uconnect sites as digital, a digital platform. And so how do we actually get sponsorship for employers to sponsor these digital platforms? So that's what we mean by digital sponsorship. So I, I saw that and I'm like, well, that's what we're talking about. So we want to clarify that. So now <laughs> jumping um, in. And, and, and also, Harold, I'll just mention, she mentioned, is it similar to the career services management system? Um, uh, just as a little bit more background on the virtual career center platform, um, what it's designed to do is actually integrate um, the content and data and information that lives across all your different systems. So we bring in actually internship and job postings from tools like Simplicity and Handshake, alumni mentor profiles from tools like People Grove and Graduate, uh, labor market data from tools like MZ. Um, and, uh, and many, many more. So it's not a replacement for any of the tools or resources that you have. It sort of is designed to integrate everything and radically simplify virtual engagement for students, for alums, um, as Harold and Leah now mentioned, even prospective students and parents, employers, community, really sort of showcase all the work that you're doing. So um, um, that's a, just a little bit of context as how it sort of fits in with some of your other uh, tools and resources that you may have. Um, so thank you for that question. But Harold, go ahead. Yeah. So really quickly, um, when I first saw uh, the Uconnect platform, it was really a matter of timing. Uh, I had an employer come to me, as Leonel said, we've been flooded. <laughs> and someone said, we have some money and uh, we really want to give something to Spelman. And they started asking me for ideas. Uh, and that was Carrier. Uh, and Carrier, I started talking to, I had worked with that recruiter for over 15 years when they were at a previous organization. And I started explaining to them what this vision was, what this platform, what my vision was for the platform. And they loved it. Uh, and actually, I must say, and I'm proud to say that, yes, they ended up being the premier sponsor uh, to get us started. But they also ended up giving us a larger gift than the virtual career center, but it was actually the virtual career center that facilitated the entire gift. And it was a half a million dollar gift. Oh. Uh, and so, so that was pretty good. And they were pretty <laughs> impressed by <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 not all to the virtual career center, clarity. <laughs> <laughs> so my thought after that was, as I was would talk to David and his team, um, they had all these different features. Right now, you're seeing a variation of a first destination um, survey that's been uh, fed into uh, the site. This is one of the products the, that you can uh, purchase in addition to the basic platform. And so 
Of course, all of us are talking about student success, first destination outcomes, what have you. And this was an opportunity that's visually striking to actually put that information uh, and make it available to whoever wants to look at things, whether by cohort, grad school, you know, employers, or by major, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, to be clear, this was an add-on. And so I said, well, okay, well, how do I begin thinking about how do I get these additional things and really build the system out to make it robust and make it attractive? Uh, because as we know, platforms such as Handshake, you know, they do so much. But this is much more than just, you know, our particular platform that drives our recruiting function. This is really a much more broader concept of what we do. And so to make a long story short, um, I began to offer sponsorships to actually do add-ons, such as the first destination uh, component you just saw, uh, and other types of integrations, APIs, uh, such as Vault, such as Candid Career. Uh, we're looking at getting ready to do something with LinkedIn Learning. We have LinkedIn Learning. Nobody's doing anything with it. And every once in a while, somebody will say, well, what about LinkedIn Learning? Well, what about it? Uh, so <laughs> so uh, David and his team have found a way to actually uh, connect LinkedIn Learning. Uh, and so, uh, so again, we start building uh, sponsors. So people are always asking us, what, what can I sponsor? So just for, for context, our campus does not have a formal corporate partners program. It is all customized. We sit down with everyone and we talk about their goals and objectives. And of course, again, as I said earlier, we all know that within that is talent acquisition. And so in the talent acquisition portion of that conversation, that's where I would bring up Uconnect. So Carrier, this is a page that you're looking at and David's been scrolling through it. Uh, this is something that the sponsor would get their own dedicated page. Uh, they're able to put their social media on the page, videos. Uh, one of the things I like um, is that there's two buttons. You'll see view our open positions and careers at Carrier. View our open positions actually publishes the jobs if they have them posted in Handshake it posts them directly to the site. And remember what I said earlier, um, you're trying to get out of the traffic. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of traffic. And I don't know how many of you know about Atlanta traffic. Atlanta traffic is bad, but Spelman recruiting traffic puts Atlanta traffic to shame. <laughs> and so it's an opportunity to stand out there. And then the other button actually takes you to uh, Carriers at Carrier. It takes you to the job portal on Carrier's site. And so there is a lot of flexibility around, you know, what can be done on the pages. And so, of course, as you can see, this is a higher level form of branding mm -hmm. that the corporation is getting that they probably can't even get on your website. But this is built for it. And, um, and tell us a little bit about the career community model that you're using to curate content from all these different systems. And then um, if you could tell us about the sort of partnership with Wells Fargo and, and how that came to be as well, that would be great. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So uh, so we have these different career communities. Uh, and so we have things like financial services that you see on the screen right now. And so that's a, that's a huge uh, cohort of companies that come to Spelman. Financial services is, is, is probably the most robust one that comes to campus. But you see the others that David has positioned on the screen. And what we're trying to do uh, is give students an opportunity to kind of focus. Uh, for those of you who work in a traditional liberal arts uh, <laughs> education environment, you know that everything is very broad. And we spend a lot of time trying to kind of reel them in uh, and trying to help them get focused. And so, um, but I do want to make clear, they don't have to live in one career community. We don't restrict them to that because that's the beauty of liberal arts uh, is the diversity of it. And so students can live in different communities, but what happens is the jobs you're seeing. So we're able to configure for instance, for financial services, we're able to configure the jobs and handshake that are finance related to publish to the particular career community. 
Uh, you're actually seeing a lot of stuff there right now. But yeah, but when you saw the jobs, <laughs> Like, when you saw the jobs, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all coming out of, we use handshakes, so that's all coming out of handshake. But again, and when you talk about to an employer, okay, you're trying to distinguish your jobs from the ocean. Well, here's a place to have your own private lake. And it can reside in this career community and those jobs can be uh, published there. You also saw uh, the vault guides. Uh, so the ones related to financial services, we're we're sending those out there. You're seeing Candid Career. Uh, you're seeing a whole bunch of stuff out there. <laughs> and one of the things I like uh, that we do that we thought about, and many of us obviously in the profession know this, is that uh, professional organizations are great networking tools. And students kind of look past them all the time, unless they have student chapters, usually on campus or something. But there's always a student initiative with any professional organization because that's part of their longevity and keeping the organization going. And so we're trying to also educate students on with this particular career community, what are the professional organizations uh, that you can join? Because as we know, that's another layer of networking, another layer of conferences, another layer of mentors, another layer of jobs, scholarships. Scholarships, I was gonna say <laughs> Yeah. On and on and on. And they don't even realize until you kind of like, and they're like, oh, and of course, the bigger the city is, the more likely some of these will have chapters actually in those cities that students can potentially, if they're meeting in person, we have to put that little caveat on there these days, if they're meeting in person, can actually uh, attend the meeting. So, or, or remote. So, yeah, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that, Harold. There's a couple questions <clears throat> in the chat. Um, uh, from Julie, um, uh, if we're going to share some information about the sponsorship tiers and documentation, we're going to be doing that after um, after the webinar over email with the recording. So there will be documentation sent out. Um, and then there were a couple of questions about <clears throat> um, uh, what Lee and Alan Harold are using to build this site. And this is <laughs> all built on UConnect. Um, and we're going to actually launch a poll uh, quickly, for those of uh, for those of you who want to learn more about UConnect, you can um, just raise your hand in response to the poll here. Um, but we're going to spend the rest of the time um, just talking tactically uh, and strategically about how Harold and Leonel have gone about, um, you know, building this great sponsorship program, engaging employers, um, and some real tactical advice. Whether you have UConnect or not, um, we're going to dive into to some of the more tactical advice. Um, in just a moment. But if you would like to learn more about the platform that Harold um, and Leonel have implemented um, to showcase their work and engage their employer sponsors, um, just uh, respond to the poll and we'll keep it up for uh, about 30 more seconds. Um, and, uh, and then we'll keep moving. David, I do want to say, because they're asking about materials and a lot of things that we did were regard really in conversations, but this is this is something that I did that's probably even better than a brochure, is we actually did a virtual tour with UConnect of the site. So sort of what you're seeing now, we did a virtual tour and uh, we recorded it. And what I did is I sent it to all my employers and, uh, and more or less kind of said, hey, if you think you might be interested in sponsorship, follow up uh, because I like to customize those conversations. So I don't have brochures per se, but I know people are visual and we're actually selling it as we're talking about it and they're actually seeing it. And so, and they can go back and watch it, watch it, watch as much as they want. And so, uh, so the person is asking that and I'm, well, you know, I'm totally okay sharing the video as well, uh, but that's sort of how we, uh, promoted, not necessarily. Uh, here's the brochure, and here are the tiers. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, yeah, if you don't mind, we'd love to send the video along with some of the other materials and the links to the site. Um, but let's get back into the conversation and <clears throat> help folks on the on the call again, whether they use UConnect or not. Um, get some best practices about how to launch and and, and manage a, a, a digital sponsorship program. So, Leonel, you're um, as mentioned, new to Langston. Um, there's a lot of folks um, <clears throat> on the um, on the webinar today that 
probably don't have an employer sponsor program and are thinking about sort of how to get started. Can you talk a little bit about some of the first steps that you took um, and a little bit about sort of your pitch internally, who'd you talk to, and then any advice that you might have for folks who are sort of at that very early stage? Yeah, my first first step was to, to see what had been done um, and, and find out internally, like a lot, a lot of our offices, we are self-generating. So the budget for my office was my salary and benefits, and that's it. Um, and so there was no operational, no no budget, vacant for two years. So uh, look back at previous years, saw that the the sponsorship package was a bit outrageous, um, just based on the size. We were also in COVID. So how was I gonna make this more virtual? We didn't know when we were coming out of COVID. So um, that's when I really started thinking about the sponsorship package, looking at other schools. I came from an institution that did not have one, uh, a private institution. We're a public state school. Uh, looked at the state schools here in Oklahoma. They have 20, 40,000 students. So not comparable, but Oklahoma, right? Looked at other HBCUs. Um, and then approached my institutional advancement group, asked if they wanted to be involved. They said, no. I said, okay. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at that point, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> so I put together a packet um, starting at the $5,000 level. And I said, if I can get 10, if I can get 10 at $5,000, that's great for me for a year. And set it each year. Each, I just want it on a yearly annual basis. Um, started um, with other aspects. So there was, um, well, what if they didn't want to do 5,000, right? Everybody's in COVID. So what are other things they can sponsor? Basically, you don't really get to come to campus for free. So you can sponsor a workshop for $750, you know? Uh, all the things I took from my previous role where we were just kind of giving stuff out for free I knew there was a high demand, you know, riding the HBCU wave. I'm like, this is the time to strike. So other, and then I thought about other programming I wanted and I wanted it to be specific for my office, not for the university. Love Langston, raise your money. I wanted it to be specific <laughs> for my office. So professional headshot day. So getting a quality photographer for that. Um, I, our students here are first generation. And they come to my office sometimes just to talk. I wanted snacks. I wanted to have coffee every morning. So there's a career, um, uh, a career coffee uh, center in my office where that uh, someone sponsored for food, right? And so it grew out of the platform needed, uh, but it also grew into, okay, not everyone can do at the $5,000 level. That gets your name on the wall and on the platform, but what are other areas? And so workshops, career treks um, to offices, which I needed money to pay for buses. So let's do that, you know? <laughs> um, and so people took advantage of that, but if you do 5,000, you get all of that. Um, and so it, it's worked really well. Again, yearly, I kept it simple. So no, your gold, your bronze, I didn't want to do any of that. That got real confusing real quick because we're in the, I'm not big enough. And I limited it to 10 because I know at 10, at the $5,000 level, that's 10 days on Langston's campus. I can manage that. I couldn't manage 50 employers wanting to have a day on campus. I can target different students with the 10 sponsors. Well, then what happened was it was, for example, MedPro said, okay, we'll do it, but now we want to do an immersion program, a foundations of insurance program. So they actually come to campus. They have a cohort of students who are learning all about insurance who will now, they're paying to go to Indiana in April for a full immersion trip. So, you know, there's different ways that within the sponsorship that we even customize various things. I mentioned Paycom in the closed closet. Um, and, and, you know, again, it's been wonderful because their name's out there and there's little perks too. Like you're in the student newspaper, um, the students, using the students for social media, if you pay the money, students will last you all day long, right? <laughs> and so um, again, getting back to, it was able to pay for the, the, the platform because again, we probably all have horrible websites 
you could not find my office on the Langston website. <laughs> so, but now you can't. It's funny. I get calls because if you Google Langston, this site comes up. Right? <laughs> so so uh, it was a great way to, to transition away from uh, Langston's website. Still linked. So still looks like it's Langston's site. It's just better. Uh, but also get that brand recognition out for our employers. And now, and the students, you hear them saying, oh, oh, Hormel, yeah, you're in Minnesota, but we know about you. Yeah, um, I love it. I love your entrepreneurial spirit that you just came into the office and sort of took such a first principles approach to thinking about the sponsorship program. And as an office of one, sort of offloaded a lot of programming and a lot of the great you know, sort of services that you might provide with a bigger staff and, and got paid for it. So <laughs> yes, I mean, I, there's, there's I lots of hats it. off to Lionel in the chat. And so um, <laughs> I'll just, I, I'll just echo that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I send, I send a parking permit, but their day on campus, they have to design that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, I just want to ask while we're, while we're on the topic, if somebody has not sort of started moving in this direction, one piece of advice in terms of how to approach what you're doing with a sponsorship program, um, uh, one piece of advice for the group. Align the sponsorship program with institutional goals and objectives. That gets buy-in from all those people with VP in their title and above. <laughs> Align it to student success, retention, persistence. Say more. How did you position it that way? I position it with we have we have a relatively low retention rate, um, and it's I said with sponsorships with uh, um, UConnect with more opportunities, our freshmen will be engaged quicker because they can see what happens after four years. There's a pathway for them that's not just academic. They can see internships. They can see people are interested in them and get those opportunities the networking. We know that first generation students sometimes struggle with building networks. This is going to help build those networks early on. And that got the institution involved. That'll yeah. help them stay semester to semester, year to year. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, Harold, I want to, I want to turn to you for a moment. Uh, there's a question um, about um, any pushback from your advancement offices or other folks on campus fighting over sponsors? Um, have you had any friction with regard to the sponsorship program that you've launched? Obviously, you're generating lots of interest and funds. Any friction from other offices? And how have you dealt with that? Uh, no friction from other offices. Again, um, we part of what helps mitigate that is, uh, first of all, Institutional Advancement and I have a great working relationship. And when I was first brought on to Spelman 20 plus years ago, they told me up front, we need for your office to be in a better situation because there are some campuses we know that those two offices can be adversarial to one another. So we sort of squashed that a long time ago. Now there's been different people. I've probably survived most all of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, so having that weekly meeting, at least on that side, that's fine. Um, you know, what's interesting, uh, with the faculty now, again, because we have so many companies coming, they're really not trying to, you know, complain about anything. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, I'm going to have to give blood. <laughs> <laughs> if I start trying to latch on to somebody and commit, so they're kind of like, hey, you can handle that. We're fine. And so, so in our environment, because we have so much activity, it's hard to process all that. In fact, I tell the employers a lot of times that if we actually entertained you all just for the sake of entertaining you all, we'd never teach curriculum because uh, you all be doing information sessions that ad nauseum <laughs> and we lose our accreditation. So that's not going to help. <laughs> um, if uh, <laughs> uh, certainly not, if um, uh, so, obviously, you know, love the comment about, you know, having a good working relationship, having a strong collaboration with those other offices as a foundation. Right. So then coming to them on the heels of many other collaborations that you've done, it's not sort of out of the blue. Any advice for folks on, on, on the call that may not have such strong relationships with other departments about how to go out there and, and build trust and, and, and build those collaborations? 
Well, I always say in general, just kind of taking it away from the site, just talking about career services yeah. in general, we've got to be collaborator, collaborators all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we may have to volunteer to do this. It may not it seem like it has nothing to do with career services, but you're building relationship equity. And so it may mean getting on a committee that has nothing to do with anything yes. <laughs> that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Judging something that has nothing to do with, you're not, with your, what you're doing. Yes. But but it does have something to do with what you're doing. You're building relationship equity. And so when it's time, people will remember, oh, that person was a great collaborator with us. And so we really should be spending a good bit of our time doing a lot of that because that helps build uh, that community. And of course, you know, when people like you, they listen to you. And so, well, well sometimes, but <laughs> it, it certainly helps. Yes. And so uh, building yeah. those relationships are really- and, and I agree, like my office used to be an advancement before the two year hiatus. So it took some getting used to, we're now in academic affairs, um, but building that relationship. Uh, it was it was rocky at first because it was it was getting people to understand at the university level, you may be dealing with the VP of an organization. I'm dealing with university relations at a corporation and they have different budgets. I come from a corporate world. I come from a university relations world. So there's different ways that giving is done. There's different ways, you know, gifts are given. Yep. And that wasn't always clear here at Langston. And so now it's a great, great working relationship of, um, I'm kind of like Harold, even in my short time, I've outlasted everyone in institutional advancement. <laughs> so I don't know what that says, but, but we used to meet weekly. Now there's no one in that room. <laughs> but you know, and it, but it, was, it was going to things like our president's scholarship gala. I had a table. So, you know, just being on those committees, like Harold said, judging something that had to do with some goats. I didn't know what that was, but I got out there and did it, right? So building the relationships among campus. But I will say there's sometimes there's a rub between career services and institutional advancement. Um, you know, one of the ways I, I didn't talk about how the money came in, I ran it through Langston's foundation, that 501c3, people, organizations could give to that. And it never got convoluted with the greater Langston. We all know money ends up missing, uh, you know, in the, in the normal account structure. But that was a great way to also help institutional advancement as well. Their investment accounts went up with that money sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. And just like sort of basic partnership principles, right? Like you have a lot that the advancement office doesn't have. Um, and they have things that you don't have. And so together you're, you know, one plus one equals three sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, thinking about having a lot of empathy for your partners across campus, understanding what their goals are, understanding what your goals are, what you bring to the table and, um, and, and vice versa can really help create a, a mutually beneficial partnership. I think the other thing that, <clears throat> you know, we talk with a lot of our partners about is sort of you know, breaking down the silos in your head and just sort of thinking about the student experience as the North Star, right, as, mm -hmm. as the ultimate goal. So it's not, you know, my goals versus your goals or, you know, the way it works in my office versus your office, like what is best for the student, what is best for the institution and how can we collaborate to do that? And so in terms of reaching out and, and sparking some of those partnerships, um, building empathy for those colleagues across campus and keeping the student in mind versus, you know, the division or office or department that that you're in um and uh th so there's a couple couple great questions in the chat i want to move a little bit um towards the conversation around engaging employers um Lino, you, know, you talked a little bit about your um employer summit uh, uh harold talk to me a little bit about how you i know that they're coming to you there's a question specifically around uh, what is your advice to schools who do not have employers knocking down their doors, uh, wanting to oh, sponsor? Oh, thanks for giving me that so, one, Dave. So, 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 so close your eyes for a second and picture yourself in a different environment where, um, you know, where there aren't employers coming to you. Um, what advice do you have for folks who are, you know, who are in that position looking to reach out to employers and get their attention? Right, right, right. That's a toughie. I, I, I will admit uh, that, that that's a tough one. I'm, I'm going to go back, I guess, first to um, 
like it's going to seem like I'm kind of getting a little off subject, but I'm not. I got to go back to what Leonel was talking about with you got to get you got to get aligned with the institution in terms of their institutional goals and their strategic goals. Uh, because I think when you're dealing with, when you don't have those um, employers knocking on your door, and even if you do, I mean, I think this is true either way you go. Um, employers, you know, they have to understand we got to get out of this conversation of these superficial terminology partnership when they're only really talking about, I want to recruit. I mean, to, to really strategically align, um, I think we have to really strategically align. And so that means being able to communicate. And so for those that, you know, maybe don't have everyone knocking at the door, uh, it's important, as Leonel was saying, I think she might have had to do this even a little bit more than I did, is just making sure that this is known, that this is a part of the strategic, you know, movement of the campus, strategic plan of the campus. So even when the president is out talking, the president ought to know about yep. the virtual charisma. Mm -hmm. I did a whole presentation to our senior team. They all know what it is. And I've got people, they're, they're having their teams on the senior team, their direct reports. You all need to watch this uh, video that Harold did. And I want you all to know about this virtual career center. So I say all that to say, if you're going to pull it off, you don't have, if you have those limited resource, limited interactions, that means the messaging of this has to be socialized greater. Yeah. That means I think the, you know, people that are decision makers, they have to know that this is part of the strategy and it has to be part of their conversation. You don't have to own it by yourself because presidents are fundraisers themselves. I mean, yes. the good ones are. Yes. Yeah. So if they're out fundraising, they need to know what this is and what you're trying to accomplish and how it fits in the overall strategic goals. So I would say definitely the strategic part of it definitely becomes paramount that it becomes part of those conversations. And again, sort of thinking about what do you uniquely, even if you don't have all the answers and all the relationships, what do you as a career office uniquely bring to the table that could be valuable for those employer partners. Maybe the relationship comes from the president or advancement or faculty members, but you bring something unique to the table, mm -hmm. recognize what that is, and then go establish partnerships with folks across campus and you know, make a joint effort, right? It's, uh, you know, it's better to, uh, to have half the, half the pie than, than none at all. So, um, so that's awesome. And, and, and I'll pose the same question to you, Leon. Nobody in your seat for two years, probably not a lot of recruiting conversations happening before you got there. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, it sounded like you started from scratch. How did you sort of think about what employers to reach out to in what order? I mean, it sounds like it was sort of rooted in the employer summit, but how did you even get people to come to the employer summit? And how did you decide to segment uh, the list and, and prioritize folks? Yeah. So I, I started with our largest majors. Um, and so we're agricultural school uh, and a, a, we had a lot of USDA, right? Uh, we know government, they don't really give money. So, <laughs> so it was like, what are other industries that our ag students could go to or other employers? So I started with them. Our school of business is not our biggest school, but they were also the easiest because I come from a corporate world, they have the money. So, <laughs> so started reaching out to banks um, accounting firms. We didn't have any accounting firms here um, and, and working relationships that way. LinkedIn was actually pretty good to use. Uh, when I did the summit, all my marketing came from LinkedIn. I would post it and then people start sharing it. And then, you know, I had the tagline, Oklahoma's only HBCU, come learn more. And I listed out the, um, the agenda, which was this is Langston. That was one. That was one of our sessions. Was this is Langston? Here is Langston in your back door. We ended up having. I did a virtual and in person uh, summit simultaneously. We had people from California, New Jersey, employers who wanted to reach out because the other thing I did was I looked at where our students come from. We're the westernmost HBCU. We get a lot of students from the West Coast. Yeah. Let me start hitting the West Coast companies. You know who are headquartered out there, uh, and so. I didn't limit the summit to anyone, you know, say, oh no, you can't come. It was open for everyone and um, to either join person in person or virtual and they had to pay. Because again, I'm all about self-generating. So they had to pay 
to come to the summit. And it was very normal, 25 mm-hmm. virtual, 50 in person. Uh, Cause we had paid, you know, we fed them well, brisket, some barbecue it was July. It was great. Uh, <laughs> and so, but they had to pay. And so, and one of the things I told them, I said, you may think it's not necessary to pay, but we are self-generating. That's why you didn't see cuts in career fair costs during COVID. Career offices still had to operate. And once I had those conversations with employers, because there was pushback, why, why is the career fair price the same? Why are we paying for the summit? Because this goes to student success. We still have to operate. And I understand your, your operating budget may have been cut. Your recruiting budget may have been cut. So maybe virtual is a better option than in person. But gone are the days where it's you get to come for free because I am self-generating. And that was the thing. When people, when organizations were coming to campus for free, we weren't seeing that return. It's like anybody could just show up. And it was like, one, I needed more professionalism around that, more structure, and you add a cost. And so you come at lunch, you pay for the lunch. Come at dinner, you pay for the dinner. But you don't get to come anymore just for free on campus. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to add to that because Please. I think that's a great point. Uh, so it's sometimes in these institutional advancement conversations, you know, not so much here. Uh, they've gotten better, uh, but they forget about career services. And again, going back to my statement, all investment leads towards talent acquisition. Everybody's getting money here, there, and everywhere. And then when it's all said and done and done and said, they're knocking down the career center door. We gave all this money and we want ex students and et cetera, et cetera. And we're looking like, you gave all this money, where is it? So I love, Lionel, when you said, no, we didn't go down on the career fair. Uh, no, because you all, for, well, sometimes the employers forget about us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And remember, remember the hand that feeds you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and even, and even, even if the school don't bring up the career center, you bring up the career center. Yep. Yeah, yes, um, absolutely. And I just want to go back to to one thing that Lionel said, which um, you know, could, could get overlooked LinkedIn, right? Mm-hmm, that's where mm-hmm. all, that's where everybody is. I think a lot of career service professionals are on LinkedIn for their own purposes to help students navigate LinkedIn, but to be able to search for, you know, employers in Oklahoma and the university recruiting folks and either send them a message or, um, you know, for them to see your post, it's, a um, it's, a you know, it's, it's a really sort of savvy way to approach it. Um, David, just really quick. So I yeah. don't do a summit, uh, but you know, I do a virtual town hall meeting at the beginning of every semester, something I started in COVID. And so I just invite, we have very robust career fairs. So I just invite everybody that I take the career fair list and I invite everybody to my virtual um, um, info session that I do at the beginning of the uh, semester that talks about recruiting and everything. And we make the virtual career center. I make sure that they know that they don't get a whole full blown presentation, but they're invited to see it in another presentation. But I've raised their awareness. So again, I bring the audience in. So again, if you don't have the money, maybe they'll have a son. Yeah. My opening meeting that I have every semester is I convene the meeting. (laughs) (laughs) Come to my party if you want to know how to recruit a spellman. So everybody virtually is invited to the party. Come one, come all. Bring friends. Uh, (laughs) I will share with you a piece of that uh, about the virtual career center and about sponsorship. So that's the way I do it. Yeah. Um, there are, um, there's a couple of really good questions in the chat. I want to ask quickly, cause you know, we talked about this briefly before in terms of making the case, right. If employers are like, I don't necessarily want to pay or what's the ROI Harold in a previous conversation, you mentioned some interesting thoughts about ROI and about sort of helping, um, helping make the case, right. For, mm-hmm. for employers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So ROI to me is return on investment. What is investment? Investment in the context of talent acquisition and in an institution (laughs) is visibility. You're looking for visibility uh, beyond just the common recruiting, uh, you know, tactics. 
uh, you're looking for a higher level of engagement. Uh, and so uh, higher level of engagement with faculty, higher level of engagement with students, obviously. Um, and then with both of those, what you're looking for is that you hope that those two things will positively influence the probability of your recruiting yield being higher than what it was when there was no investment. Yeah. And so I think we got to get away from this concept of pay to play. You know, it's not nobody's playing. I'm not playing. I don't think you are. Either. <laughs> you know, this is no, this is serious business. Yeah. Uh, and so you're trying to position yourself is what you're doing. And so the investment translates into visibility, higher level of engagement yeah. and increased probability of increased placement yield. That's what you're investing in. Simply coming to somebody's campus, well, that's a recruiting budget. You, you have to have, if you're a recruiter, you have to have a travel budget. You have to have all of that. So I call that the cost to do business. Yep. So that's not necessarily investment. You have to do that. You can't recruit without that. That's, that's part of your operating expense. So don't put the guilt on the career center about an operating expense. Right. Uh, no. <laughs> investment. <laughs> Yes, I love that. Um, and and we could probably talk for another hour. But I know, right? That's all we're no, I mean, coming up against the hour. Leonel, I want to, I want to, I want to um, finish with you. Same question, right? In terms of helping, sort of pitch employers. What's the angle? Any advice for for those on the call? Yeah, it's positioning yourself, just like Carol said, positioning yourself, and it's long term. Yes. So it's it, you're not gonna come in one year and say, oh, you know, I got this many students it's not we're we started from scratch so it's long-term investment it is being here and that's what i love about the program i established is the employers yes they sponsor but then they each have a little bit of a, a different spin so one did student employee of the month to help student success um, and so it's that long term um, you're getting that investment you are investing it's not just you know come career fair cool gone um, it's not post and pray. It is you are coming, you are investing in, in these students. <laughs> a lot of you, handshake is full of posting and prayers. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's so, but it's um, investing to get the, the return that you need. Yeah. Yeah. You two are so special. Thank you so much for your time. You're an inspiration to the field. Um, the chat speaks for itself. Um, uh, hats off to both of you for, for doing such incredible work. Um, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon, taking time out of your day. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all so much. This was great.